many people here are thinking about what it would mean pretty soon, perhaps, to have uh, a left-wing Labour government. And those questions about uh, international solidarity uh, and the way our movement exists across borders uh, is going to be really, really important because these questions and the, the instinct of the labor, you know, laborism historically is to contain itself within national bounds. So this conversation couldn't be more important. Um, and so we heard a lot about the state, and I'm going to hand over to Elif, who is going to talk about somewhere where there is uh, quite a strong, deep state uh, and some uh, pretty dark goings on as well. I think your microphone is on, so uh, yeah, Hi. there we go. <laughs> Elif Sarakan. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, before I begin, um, especially on the topic of anti-fascism and a struggle against it, I think it will be meaningful to commemorate all of the revolutionary anti-fascists who have sacrificed their lives and, and have set precedent for us to be here today. I want to particularly commemorate an heroic anti-fascist, Anna Campbell, 26 years old, from Lewis, who went out to fight against the fascism and the invasion of the Turkish state alongside the YPJ. And I also want to commemorate my beautiful comrade, Mehmet Aksoy, who on the 26th of this, one, on this, month, of this month, it will be a year since we lost him in Raqqa as a result of ISIS fascism. So I think it's interesting that I go after our comrade speaking about Germany because, you know, one of the inspiration that the roots of fascism in Germany took was from Turkish fascism, actually. Hitler once said that Atatürk, who is the founding, uh, you know, father of the modern Turkish Republic, he said, Atatürk is my master and Mussolini and I are his students. So, you know, the roots of the Turkish Republic are essentially built on um, fascistic principles with one nation, one flag, one language, and one religion. So any diversification from this has, for the part, especially the past hundred years, been seen as a threat to Turkishness. And so what we see with Erdogan today isn't anything new. And I think this is, you know, this is why it's so important to talk about our anti-fascism being international and internationalist, because, you know, it comes to our agenda when it starts happening in Europe again, um, and, you know, generally in the wider West, but, you know, our people in many parts of the world have been experiencing fascism for, you know, decades and decades consistently, and there have been profound resistances against these, that means we don't have to reinvent the will. You know, we have examples of, um, of resistances and of struggles against, you know, particularly fascism. And so, you know, everyone knows about the despotic authoritarianism of Erdogan, and I just want to, because, you know, for the, for the purposes of the time limit, I'll just, like, parts of my talk will just be in, like, bullet point form just so we can fit some parts in. Um, <laughs> so, um, Turkey at the moment is the largest prison for journalists. Turkey, uh, Erdogan's Turkey, has imprisoned more journalists than the rest of the world put together. Uh, not to mention imprisoning academics who literally signed a peace petition calling for peace between the Kurdish movement and the Turkish state, and this was seen as terrorism. So they have either been eg uh, forced into exile or they've been imprisoned or just lost their jobs in universities. Um, not to mention that elected uh, members of parliament um, of the People's uh, Democratic Party, the HDP, being imprisoned, including the two co-leaders, or the, now the two former co-leaders, Selatin Demirtas and Figen Yüksekta. Um, this party was elected into the Turkish parliament with six million votes. 
um, and constitutes the third largest party in the Turkish parliament. But despite, despite this, many of its MPs, including its leaders, have been imprisoned and thousands of its members. And so this process of what we see now, and especially of the change of the constitution and Erdogan um, concentrating more power in his uh, personage, um, deepened after he collapsed the peace process between uh, the Kurdish movement and the Turkish state, and therefore started an aggravated isolation against the Kurdish people's leader, Abdullah Öcalan, who has been on a Turkish island prison for 20 years, and was kidnapped uh, illegally um, at the Greek embassy in Kenya as a result of the operation by uh, the CIA, Mossad, uh, EU, and of course, uh, Turkey. And so he's been kept in isolation on a prison island guarded by 1,000 prison, uh, 1,000 uh, soldiers. He is the sole prisoner in, on this island. And so this process, um, has has um, has you know gotten more and more fascistic over time, and now has uh, in January kind of I guess you know for Erdogan bad fruit in his invasion of Afrin, and so on the on January twentieth uh, this year they invaded uh, northwest Syria, so you know cross they crossed their border apparently in the attempt to protect their borders. Um, and so, you know, this I think shows to us that fascism is an empire of fear. You know, it's motivated by fear and therefore our solution, our alternative must be motivated by hope and for love for a better world. And Therefore, you know, we see, and I, I, want, I wanted to talk about this stuff because fascism certainly comes in many forms, and, you know, it's certainly way more divided than we think we are in the left. I know we fight a lot on everything, but, you know, we certainly are way less divided than fascism is, you know, because, ironically, many Turkish fascists will be supportive of the uh, Palestinian struggle, and this is what I... And, you know, uh, whatever their motivation may be, there, there are expressions of solidarity for, you know, the just and the legitimate uh, Palestinian struggle, which is why we need an international, international and internationalist solidarity that can reject every form of fascism, because that can be our only solution. And, you know, we, we've seen this all over the world and, you know, we've unfortunately seen certain expressions of support for the so-called, the, the Kurds, you know, f apparently fighting Islam um, when they, the defeat of, uh, while they were defeating and fighting against ISIS, you know, it's important to understand that there's 40 million Kurds and majority of them are Muslim. So obviously they wouldn't be fighting against uh, Islam, but rather the fascism of ISIS. So, you know, we saw in the most practical examples in the last um, few years that it wasn't fascism that defeated ISIS. It was the YPG and the YPJ led by Kurdish women and motivated by direct democracy, peace, freedom, and women's liberation that defeated ISIS. And so, and so of course, the struggle continues. And I just want us for a moment to imagine a society, a land, where two world systems, two ideologies, two future projects are clashing on a colossal level. While one is based on women's liberation, ecology, and pluralism, the other is made of misogyny, masculine domination, monism, and exploitation. One shines with all colors of life, while the other represents darkness. And this place is Afrin, this place is Rojava, and this place is Kurdistan. And so, as uh, the Kurdish people's leader, Abdullah Öcalan, has said, a society cannot be free without women's liberation. So we can't be anti-fascists unless we're against patriarchy, unless we're against capitalism, unless we are anti-colonial, anti-racist, and anti-nation state as well. And so our solidarity with each other must not be charity, but solidarity, deep internationalist solidarity, seeing our struggles as one and not just giving each other, 
giving each other charity. And, you know, when it comes to our alternatives, we don't necessarily, I mean, you know, it's 2018, so obviously certain uh, aspects of our, our um, the way we've done things throughout history, of course, you know, need to transform. But it's important to understand that for thousands of years, our peoples, you know, whether it's in the Middle East or other parts of the world, we knew how to live together. And yeah, nothing was perfect, but nothing, you know, ever needs to be perfect. But the, the idea is that we know how to live without the plague of sectarianism, without, without, um, without fascism and without, um, without capitalism, most importantly. And so I think when we talk about a solution, before everything, we, we really need to tap into our collective memories and understand how our people and our ancestors have done things and of course you know allow that to transform our understandings as well and therefore be able to take it forward from there and you know as many people probably know that some of the most radical revolutions in the world have been revolutions that have been deeply embedded in their history so we really need to recognize our history and if we don't then our our anti-fascism really will be missing something and I just want to start to conclude with, um, there's, there's a campaign that was uh, launched by the Kurdish women's movement called Khwabun Khwaparastin. And Khwabun means to be yourself and Khwaparastin means to defend yourself. And it means you can't defend yourself unless you learn who you are and to be yourself. And this isn't just in like the narrow terms of identity politics, but, but the wider understanding again of what our histories are and how we can also take that forward. And it's also on, on this, uh, based on the understanding that nationalism can never be our self-defense or our resistance. Our self-defense and our resistance must be inherently pluralist and inherently um, based on the principles of direct democracy, gender equality, and uh, particularly ecology, a harmonious relationship with our nature that, you know, of course feeds us. So, you know, just to end, there's, there's you know, we could go on about this for a very long time, but I just want to really urge people, you know, millions of Kurdish people see uh, Abdullah Öcalan as the very person who could negotiate a peace process for the uh, for 40 million Kurdish people. This is including his most critical opponents and including the the enemy, the Turkish state. So I would really urge people to engage with his ideas um, of democratic nation, of democratic confederalism, and and most importantly of the Kurdish women's movements, uh, women's liberation ideology. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. I, I think really important to say, um, many of you in this room will have heard of a now former Labour MP called John Mann, a uh, friend of the AKP, Stu Verdogan. very pleased that he's left the party. But that kind of thing, I think, should never have had a place um, in a socialist party in the first place. And I think that's something to be very clear about. Um, we have... Uh, as a movement moves towards power, uh, perhaps a tendency towards a kind of conservatism, particularly on foreign policy. I think it's something that we need to think about much more clearly. I would also note, as well as those who died um, fighting ISIS, there are uh, people who have returned to this country and are facing prosecution for having gone over to support that struggle there. Um, for instance, Jim Matthews, um, it's hugely, hugely important uh, that the movement sort of turns out and makes some noise about these prosecutions. He has won his case, but there's another, there's another one going through now, right? There's another kid who's back. Um, and they don't win without the kind of support. There were big demonstrations outside uh, the High Court for, for Jim's case. Uh, and I just urge you to, to keep an eye on that stuff. Um, so we've had a bit, uh, and I guess one of the questions you've had hovering over us are exactly where those boundaries are between the state, the government, fascism, racism, stuff like that. I want to hand over to Gary now to talk a bit about that, a bit about the, the ways that we think about those things.
Um, yeah, so I'm going to be uh, pretty brief. I want to. I wanted to start just just with what I think is a need to reflect on what we mean by fascism. That we've had a long time of it kind of almost being an epithet. You know, oh, he's just a fascist. But we are now in a moment where fascism is a mainstream ideology across Europe, and I would say uh, in in the states that it is um, it's at the centre. Uh, of power, there are fascists in governments, and so um, it behoves us really to understand, have a clear understanding of what we are, um, are dealing with. And the things I'm going to say, they're not particularly re revelatory, but we have to understand that fascism, we shouldn't mistake or confuse fascism and racism. There is racism in fascism, of course, but fascism is about something bigger. It is about, well, not bigger necessarily, but it's about um, uh, the undermining of democracy completely. Um, it's about the centralization of power in the state. It's about authoritarianism. Uh, it's, uh, it has kind of um, very, very dangerous versions of kind of uh, both masculinity uh, and uh, and whiteness, and that does shape what we do about it, because it means that we both have the potential and the necessity for kind of quite broad coalitions to fight this thing, because a range of uh, organizations, whether it's trade unions or civil liberty organizations or whatever, are um, uh, are going to be affected and will come in under uh, a broad anti-fascist um, agenda. I think it's very important, um, following up on what you were saying about challenging fascists in the streets, where we find them. Um, I also think it's quite important not to fetishize those, um, um, those clashes with fascists, as some do, I think, which um, I think um, becomes kind of wrapped up in a certain kind of machismo. And, um, I mean, w when they're there, you have to confront them. I don't have any problem with that. I don't think it's about kind of just doing what you can. I think you have to, uh, uh, you have to do what you have to do to get those people off the streets. But there's a difference between embracing that and fetishizing it as though it is the supreme goal to run around and find them and physically kind of uh, attack them for the simple reason that that's not ultimately how this job is going to be done. Uh, it is one facet, and I would argue not necessarily always the most, um, uh, not necessarily almost always the most important. Um, I think then if we talk about broad coalitions, then the issue is who's leading that coalition, you know what I mean? That there's, um, uh, I'm happy to march alongside a whole range of people, so long as the people at the front are the people whose agenda I kind of, you know, I'm quite keen on in a, in a broad sense. And that demands an understanding of this moment, that, um, that we didn't get here by accident. Neoliberal globalization, that force without a face, has um, undermined democracy to the point where it's really kind of, people see it as a performative act. They don't uh, trust politicians to actually uh, get anything done. Doesn't matter who you vote for, capital gets in. Um, it's everything operates according to the golden rule and that's that those that have the gold make the rules. And so people get pissed off. They get very, um, uh, legitimately uh, angry and it's up for us to kind of shape our understanding of how this has happened that when just to take the issue of refugees and migration that it's for us to say look we bombed them and now they're coming and, and that's why they're coming we, um, we undermined their democracy and that's why they're coming. We exploited them. We colonized them. We did all this. So this, th these people who 
uh, you think of as in some way having nothing to do with you, they have everything to do with you. That we have created a situation where, uh, in which this moment uh, can happen. Our policies, our government, our, uh, you know, the things we buy in stores that you know, people, uh, that leaves people exploited, that we have to give that global framework in order for people to understand where we are now, because there are, um, there are legitimate grievances. There are legitimate grievances which the fascists play on. Now, those grievances are people feeling that they are not in control of the world they live in, that their high street doesn't look the same uh, as it used to, that they can't get a job or they can't get a house or they can get a job but the wages are too low, their benefits are being cut. Those are all legitimate grievances. The issue then is who you blame. Because it wasn't the Roma that traded in credit default swaps and crashed the economy. It wasn't Syrian refugees who were bailed out by public money and then took loads of bonuses. It's not women in hijabs who are closing libraries and underfunding schools. And in the absence of that broader global understanding, uh, all kinds of hucksters can intervene, sometimes posing as more left than us, sometimes posing as though they have the interests of the poor and the working class uh, uh, at heart when they don't. And uh, which is why it's important, and I think we saw this in France with Macron uh, against uh, Le Pen, where there was a real concern that, look, fine, Macron, Macron wins, but then what? Because Macron's victory and the policies that he's going to pursue means that next time round, they're going to be even bigger. And what the hell are we doing breathing a sigh of relief that an open fascist gets 30 or percent in an election? That is an absolute disaster. Uh, which leads me, really, to my final point, and it echoes points that have been made uh, here, which is that people... It's all very well, for example, and I think Labour has generally, generally not always, but generally understood that racism is a bad thing. <laughs> what they didn't understand was that anti-racism was a good thing. Um, that, um, yes, this hopelessness is a bad thing, but therefore give people hope that we need an agenda that does, isn't just about fighting fascism, but is also about giving hope uh, and giving solidarity uh, and giving a, 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 some alternative to the place that we are. Because in the absence of alternative, that is where the hucksters will reside. That's where they will peddle their wares. They are actually being much more successful about that than we are right now. And uh, I don't say that with any, with any joy in my heart at all. We are going to have to do a lot better. That an awful lot of the people who they are galvanizing are people who should be with us. And so we have to go, and while we are fighting the fascists, we have to, we have to convert uh, their followers. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I think, uh, I think this is the, that's so important. It's one of the things when you know, there is a kind of certain history of anti-fascism that gets trotted out about those sort of episodic street battles as being the, the high points to them. But actually, you, know, you start to look a bit closer and you see, you know, you know neighbourhood organising committees, you see, uh, you know, tenants' organisations and that kind of deep stuff that's really not so easily, you know, imagined as a kind of cathartic moment, but actually was probably the motor that, that, that drove that stuff away. Um, of course, I think your point about history is hugely important, um, that there is, you know, that until we start thinking of the British populace as imbricated or part of or linked to all of these other peoples uh, globally, 
And until we realize that the, the history of Britain, despite uh, what is taught in schools, isn't just some Tudors and then a rather noble war between 1939 and 45, uh, we won't have a real sense of, of where we are in this country. I want to hand over to Nalini Stamp now, who is uh, currently living in a country where norm erosion is the norm um, and where those questions between uh, racism, fascism, between state and movement are really, really active. Nalini. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, I do this thing particularly because I come from uh, 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 black Southern, uh, even though I'm not from the South, uh, organizing traditions though. So I'm going to make everybody sing. No, just kidding. I'm going to sing though. Um, so if, if, if y'all just like, uh, like, come on, just like tap all feet, right? All right, wait, let me see. All right, but I need y'all to have some rhythm, okay? So just, <laughs> um, oh, which one are we going to do? All right. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 All right. Just bringing us together, you know. <laughs> I think some of the ways that uh, we need to come together, uh, uh, talking to the points before, is, is, is through other forms of communication, not just like dialogue, but like connecting cult culturally and spiritually. Um, so yeah, uh, the US, hmm, where do I start? So, <laughs> so I'm just like kind of taking on uh, what people were saying, I definitely think that the US is in a point where We've said a lot of times, like even Donald Trump, it makes me throw up. Uh, people are like, oh, fascist, 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 just using the word over and over and over again. And until recently, I didn't really, I wasn't a believer. I just was like, we're just throwing out the word, we're just throwing out the word. And with some of the stuff with the recent border crisis that we've been having where as soon as Donald Trump got elected, the entire immigration system was just ripped out under, under us. Um, Obama was the deporter in chief, right? He had deported two million people. He's still my black president. Um, but <laughs> he still deported two million people. It's complicated, y'all, nuance. Um, <laughs> so, and, but at the same time, there was a system. A system which folks who have been working in immigration um, had known, had been able, activists and organizers were able to actually still combat, right? Because they knew the playing field. As soon as Donald Trump got elected into office, the playing field was wiped. Um, particularly with stuff like the Muslim ban and, um, you know, people just starting to show up at check-ins and just say, oh, you're on final deportation notice. So I say that all to say is that what we're, what we're facing in the U.S. is the exact point of 10 years after the financial crash, when people were struggling, my family lost our homes, black folks in the United States were lost 60% of the wealth, combined with all the wealth we lost because, you know, slavery and shit. Um, and so, so it's just like, and keep going. Um, and we, you know, you have people who are struggling. You have stuff like um, NAFTA and jobs were taking away from like millions of people, outsourcing, all of these things. And you have that combined with the tension of having a black president, combined with the tension of people <coughs> rising up and protesting on immigration reform and saying not one more deportation to Obama and protesting our criminal justice system, which is the worst in the world, right? So you have all these tensions flaring up at the same time and you have a vast majority of people who wanted an anti-establishment candidate. But what they were sold was, was fascism. And in the worst part, because people were just trying to get by. Right? There's a lots of people you talk to who you talk to some Trump voters and they're like, well, I wanted Medicare for all. I'm really sorry you thought that was going to happen with Donald Trump. But the reality is people, you know, since we don't have health care and we don't have, you know, basic rights, um, people were just trying to find a way out. Now, I do, I think that to get to the point, especially in the U.S. and to get to globally, we have to have movements that are connected 
and, and making sure that we're making the case that there's an alternative that is rooted in anti-racism, right? That is rooted in um, destroying the patriarchy. <laughs> Smash it. Um, that is ro rooted in, 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 in a class struggle. And we cannot no longer separate them. A lot of folks say, well, just, you know, focus on the class things. All, what is it? All, all boats will rise with the tides. Um, and if we continue to focus on that, right? We're going to lose a majority of people. And we're going to allow the fascists to continue to say, oh, well, you're losing your job because of immigrants, or you're losing your job because black people are lazy, or you're using, losing your job because X, Y, and Z, right? We have to actually make the connection and tell people that this is the way forward. And I, I, I'm going to talk about Steve Bannon because I'm obsessed with him. And I'm not like, He's gross. He <laughs> makes me want to vomit when I look at him. A lot of people do. Um, but <laughs> Bannon is, is is coming for broader European elections, right? How, how many people have heard of that? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, but Bannon, Bannon, is, Bannon is coming. Um, and it's actually freaking scary because people are not ready for it. Because Bannon's ultimate goal is to unite the working class. I know, but still, it is. And he will do so by... His coalition, we are really lucky, and one of the, 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 the fights that we worked on at the Working Families Party in the United States was to defeat an infrastructure bill, jobs and infrastructure, which would create millions of jobs. Uh, it would be, probably create like two. Um, it would be most, it was, it was an infrastructure bill that would mostly go to corporations, trickle down economics, you know, that kind of stuff, but to regular folks who need work, it would be an infrastructure bill. People would say, oh, great, and also our roads and our Infrastructure is shit in the United States. Excuse my language. Um, it's, re it's really piss poor. Go to the South. Go to the deep South. Go to Mississippi. Man. Anyway, um, so the, his, his goal was to create this coalition. He did, right? Of white supremacists, um, rich Republicans like uh, the Koch brothers, um, uh, white working class folks in the masses, and to push forward an infrastructure bill so that they would be in power for a really long time. And th th we fought back by saying that's not like, that's not going to be a real infrastructure bill. It's just going to go to corporations. It's going to go. And people were resonant, right? Folks who desperately needed jobs understood that corporations weren't in their interest. So there's an opening there. But as long as we, um, on the broader left in the world, and as folks said, you know, we don't always agree, um, as long as we don't actually face that we need to be completely anti-racist, and not just, like, say we're anti-racist and be cute about it, like, actually live anti-racist values, right? Put your bodies on the line, and I'm also not about fetishizing stuff because Heather Heyer died last year, right? Heather Heyer died last year. A white lady. They killed a white lady. When you start killing white people in the United States, you know you're in trouble. Um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but she died. Um, was killed, murdered. And we need to start to make sure that we're putting our bodies in the line, but not over-fetishizing it, because it's not about just the clashes in the streets, as Gary said. Um, but we need to actually come up with that alternative and that vision. And until we actually have white people on the left, other non particularly in the United States, non-black folks, um, non-migrants on the left who are actually taking anti-racist values and standing and saying, actually, we cannot have socialism without destroying racism, then we're not actually going to get to the point where we can beat back the fascists because they're using these divides. They'll see them, right? They're using the divides and the cracks that are already in our society and they will take advantage every single corner and they will use it through social media, all the cool things, hashtag this, hashtag that. And we need to just make sure that our people, <laughs> to say woke, but like, I hate that term now, <laughs> but like, you know, our, 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 our people are actually attentive enough, right? Our folks are, are, are learning, even if you got to meet people where they're at, because I fundamentally believe in that. I'm not going to just quote Marx and just shout Gramsci at you. I'm going to meet you where you at right? <laughs> uh, because everybody don't got college education. Um, and so now I'm just rambling. Um, but I will, the last thing that I'll say uh, about Bannon, about um, fighting anti-fascism is that um, it 
takes also a level of, the, to speak to Gary's point about the broad coalition, the whole meeting people where they're at, we can't, we really can't just be shouting at people and just saying like, oh, well, Mark said this and Gramps, she said that. Because if you would have said that to me eight years ago, I would have been like, I don't give a fuck. Like at the end of the day, I was trying to just get paid work a nine to five or work some shifts that I was working at at the time. And we need to just tell, we need to say, what are you going through? How is your liberation bound with mine and how are we actually going to get out of this together? Thanks. Thank you, Marini. I, I just wanted to say that uh, also Thank you for opening with singing because it, it seems to me and one of the things uh, I, I often say is that for a political movement to thrive, for it to survive, it needs to have a certain kind of social thickness to it, right? It's not just discussions about, you know, what this economic policy will do in terms of this, that or the other. It's not just a kind of dry question of electoral mathematics. It's about uh, those kind of thick warm social experiences that bind people together and inspire them. And that's really fundamental to building a political movement. Um, I wanted to just put a question to the panel and open it up to the floor. Um, and if we can keep our questions, you know, resembling questions, that would be cool. Um, yeah, so, so for me, I guess the, there's always a practical question about all of this, you know, these conversations about international anti-fascism, um, and it, it, it takes kind of two forms, right? One is uh, that, that question of, of how, you know, how to act, right? Um, because the old dictum is that you uh, act against your own government, because that's where you have the most power, right? Um, and then the question, and it's a question that I've kind of been touching on throughout, uh, throughout this panel, is that question of the kind of compromises you make when a movement gets near power. And that's going to be different, I guess, right? Like, so in the US, you have this kind of, uh, what, what's the famous saying, you know, uh, one party but two forms. Um, uh, although maybe that's changing, right? Um, and here you have a, a Labour Party where it's always had a tradition, uh, of, of, you know, socialist organizing in. It's had anti-racists in it. It hasn't been an anti-racist party. That tradition is perhaps now more dominant than it's ever been. But the, the nature of those compromises when you're heading towards power uh, over a state, uh, how, how does that fit with our anti-fascism? Thought? Uh, I'm going to take anyone who wants to jump in. I do inspiring questions, clearly. <laughs> yeah. So for us, it's not only to make compromises, it's like kind of a strategy to work with other people together, to work, to make kind of collaborations, alliances on some subjects with parties, with unions, with NGOs, to make the anti-fascist fight like widen widen it up so and then we have big demonstrations manifestations blockades and something and that's not like we only make compromises we want to build a, a big big anti-fascist movement in germany and that's what necessary we think um so I think I think the qu question probably has a bit of a double answer in a sense where you know there's n there's immediate and necessary um, situations that we need solutions to you know uh, what the Tory party has done to the UK and you know obviously as a Kurdish person Theresa May labeling 40 million Kurds as terrorists is obviously very scary for us because we see what precedent it's being, what precedent her and her government are setting in terms of, you know, racism, obviously. But I think there's two things. How to act. I think more than where we're trying to get to, the method is more important than where we're trying to get to. And this is what I think is 
potentially what we can probably like the most what is potentially the most important thing we can learn from the Kurdish movement is that in the birthplace of patriarchy, women are liberating themselves. So clearly in terms of method, it's done something right. And I think it's important because, you know, what you say is what you said about meeting people where they're at. That's exactly, you know, one of the one of the central methods of the Kurdish movement is that, you know, historically a lot of its society, a lot of Kurdish society is quite conservative. So, you know, the mo the the first uh, strategy and duty that the Kurdish movement took upon itself was to gain the trust of its people and gain the trust of its base. And it's certain undeniably done that. You know, it, when even in the UK, you know, I th one of someone I was speaking to said, you know, when the Kurdish uh, community center calls for a protest, you know, there's going to be a protest. And, you know, the, the Kurdish, we've been here for about. Uh, you know, the Kurdish community has been here for about 30 years and still it can continuously mobilize its base. And, you know, I think it's really about staying in touch with that. But in terms of the compromises, I think, I think parliamentary politics can and are useful in certain ways. But as an, as if we're trying to build an anti-fascist, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti all of the stuff I already said, movement, we, uh, that can't be our main focus. Parliamentary politics can, should and and should and can be seen as a mere tool in assisting what we can do, but that should not be the main focus. So, in terms of compromises, you know, it's inevitable that entering into the power of you know uh, the UK and therefore par like Parliament as a government, as a left socialist uh, government. Unfortunately, there's going to be compromises made because the system is not set up to serve exactly what we want it to serve. So therefore, we can let those people do their parliamentary thing, but our focus has to be our communities and our, and our society and our base. Okay. Well, it really just follows on from there, really. That I think there's an important distinction we have to make between the electoral and the political. Uh, which are often people talk about them as either the same thing, and they're not. And um, uh, I'd like to see a Labour government under Jeremy Corbyn. That would be a fantastic thing. Uh, and when that government is elected, we will have to put a huge amount of pressure on it to make sure it does the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that's the political. And so, you know, power concedes nothing without demand. We are, if our principle is anti-fascism uh, and uh, it, you know in and we're going to do that in a certain way then um, if we don't advocate for that then who will and so it's really a question of um, there are elections and when there are elections we do what we need to do uh, and then there is politics and in politics we do what we need to do and there's there's no I don't feel that there is, needs to be uh, a contradiction in that. We give critical support to those who give any, you know, who give a certain amount of support to us. Yeah, thank you. Really briefly, I think. I mean, I I, I agree with everything's been said. I would I would I would just like in a. Um, there's always going to be different people who are in charge, right? Like there's always going to be new governments and folks who get elected and it is the job of people to always hold them accountable. Nobody's perfect, right? People like say in the States are like, oh my God, if, if only Bernie Sanders, it's like, <laughs> he said that reparations he doesn't know about. And honestly, we're not gonna get free unless we have reparations from all these countries over here. Um, and so the reality is, is that, it, it, you know, nobody is perfect, right? And if you look, it's not about, it's, it's um, there's a, a saying in the States where it's like people over party. And I just fundamentally think that that's, that, that is a value that people need to do no matter who's in charge. It's like, what are the people's needs and always confronting it. 